uh, Javier, who, um, uh, my screen is blinking, <laughs> uh, um, who is from uh, Newborn Solutions. And uh, he has a very interesting story to share with us uh, today. Um, he has been doing quite some things in the past. I mean, he has a PhD in uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, he has been working together with uh, MIT and also thanks to his company, Newborn Solutions, uh, a few years ago, he was uh, voted as one of the most promising uh, under 20, uh, sorry, 35 year olds in the field. And uh, among many awards, I think most important for EIT health community is that in 2020, uh, he and um, his company, Newborn Solutions, they also secured the very first place in the uh, EIT Health Catapult Finals. So uh, a pan-European, very big recognition for his work um, with his company where they are finding quick and easy, cost-effective uh, ways to detect uh, infections. And, and he is here with you. I mean, this meeting is very selective. So, I mean, differently from other EIT Health uh, alumni events where many people could like dial in in the number of hundreds. This is very exclusive. So um, uh, this kind of small intimate atmosphere where everybody is on the stage and can ask uh, later questions uh, from Javier about his journey, uh, how he has managed to, to make all things happen in such a short time. Uh, and uh, especially in the field of healthcare where, you know, we, we know that the changes might take sometimes centuries. So very happy to uh, have you here uh, today, Javier. Thank you, Timo. And, and maybe in the beginning, you um, uh, share uh, a bit um, from what you're doing. And then later, we can take the questions and answers uh, session uh, interactive. Uh, a bit logistically in today's meeting. So if you have a question, um, there are two ways. You can either like write it down in a chat uh, if you are a bit more shy. Otherwise, uh, there are a number of buttons in your Zoom you can see. One of them is also to raise a hand. So raise a hand and, and let me know um, when you would like to ask the question. So we can dial in and, and um, make sure that we are doing things in orderly fashion. But okay, let's well, let's uh, give it a go. Javier, all right. it's yours. Uh, Timo, um, I was planning to to give a brief uh, introduction overview of the company, like yeah. actually using the same slides that I use for the catapult. Uh, Great, but, sure. But I I don't see the uh, the share uh, function here. Um, uh, which... Let me. Uh, if you press the green button. Ah, share screen. Sorry, I saw, I see. Yeah. So yes, um, the idea is to. So if I'm pitching like in the catapult, that means that it's a very short pitch, uh, yeah. because I guess the the idea is that we share uh, our experience, a uh, way of doing things, not only what we accomplish, but uh, to have this coffee conversation, which I think is the most interesting uh, thing. So I, it's a host disabled participant screen sharing. So I can't. Really? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, let me see advanced options. All participants. Um, and uh, I would like to take advantage to thank all, all the attendees. Okay. Yeah. Now everybody should be able yeah. to share a screen. Try, try yeah. now. Yeah. There we go. All right, uh, so it's uh, my pleasure to, to talk to you about what we're doing at Newborn Solutions. So we are detecting non, uh, in a non-invasive way uh, and uh, detecting and monitoring infections in fluids that are uh, like water um, in the body. We have a few of those. And the first application is the infant meningitis. And that is because we have identified this need uh, to be most urgent, this population. So the problem here is that it's very hard um, to suspect the disease. 
um, in industrialized countries like ours uh, in, in Europe, I understand we are, I don't know where all the attendees are coming from, but in Europe and industrialized countries, the incidence is relatively low. Uh, that means that, that, that there are few cases out there uh, that, that they can present with very specific symptoms, fever, um, uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, uh, poor feeding, uh, and babies have this uh, system that is still weak, they're still developing, right? And they have this limited um, expression, so they cannot tell you, hey, I'm feeling bad, I have neck ache here or whatever. But meningitis can kill in a matter of hours, right? If not detected early. We have 250,000 babies uh, suspected of meningitis every day uh, that who receive a lump of puncture. Uh, this is the only method today uh, to detect the disease in this population. Um, and in, as you can see, it's an invasive procedure to draw a sample of the cerebrospinal fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. The problem with this is that 95% of these lumbar punctures are negative. Um, um, sorry that I'm not seeing the slides here, but uh, let me change uh, much better here. So it's invasive, okay. But the problem is to get a clean sample. So every time you, you puncture, one in, a, in two cases, in neonatal cases, you get blood contamination from peripheral um, um, capillaries. And that means that the, the first thing that you want to check is the white blood cell count, because that's a biomarker that indicates the presence of, of infection. And when you have blood contaminating your sample, you no longer know whether those white blood cells come, come from the fluid which is very clear, it's like water, or comes from blood, right? So you need to wait for bacteriologic results three days later. Uh, and you have to preventively treat and hospitalize the patient. And that's what explains this uh, a huge amount of uh, necessary costs um, by um, uh, European hospitals. So we want to change all these, and that's why we're developing an ultrasound-based device uh, that it's actually a counting device. It's not an imaging device, it's a counting device. And what it does, you place it on the fontanelle of the baby. It's this probe connected to a electronics on a, on a base, small base. Um, and you place it on the fontanelle. The fontanelle is that area of the head of the baby where the bones are not closed yet. And that's uh, a nice window uh, for doing echography of the brain for, for neonates. So we, you, we, we, we would be using that window so that we have high resolution and high sensitivity to count cells in the fluid that is right below that fontanelle tissue and therefore above the brain. So we're not looking into the brain, into the ventricles. We're looking in the, uh, the space between brain and tissue. And that's, um, and that's only five, six millimeters from, sur from surface, right? So it's very superficial. Um, we have shown a very high sensitivity that we have published these results. Uh, this sensitivity to two cells per microliters uh, is from laboratory um, data uh, because we have not yet um, uh, been able to quantify that sensitivity in, in vivo. Um, the device is actually fast in getting images. So it will, the, fi the final product will, will actually be very fast. We're using artificial intelligence to recognize images and, and data. The big advantage here is that you don't need to interpret data. Uh, you don't need to interpret the image that is being collected because it automatically makes the counting of the cells. And uh, it will reduce significantly costs by reducing those 95% of lumbar punctures that are negative, by reducing those uh, medication and hospitalization associated to contaminated samples with blood, etc. We have several scientific publications related to all advancements in this uh, area. We have also developed uh, a membrane, which is, it has the size of it's one centimeter thick that you place on the tip of the, of the probe, it's internal. So you place it like clack, and then you place it on the, on the head and that allows optimum uh, coupling into tissue. You know that echography uses uh, this acoustic gel for doing, to, for obtaining images, for, for coupling into the medium. Uh, but that is very user dependent. And, and because we're looking at, we, we are aiming at such a high sensitivity to detect 10 micron cells 
we need to uh, reach maximum sensitivity. So our device is a combination of a very good design of the hardware, uh, good algorithms with artificial intelligence, and very good um, coupling material that allows this super high sensitivity. Um, that means that when compared to the only alternative in the current standard of care, which is the lumbar puncture, uh, we will be a non-invasive alternative for screening, for triaging. Remember that when there's a positive case indicated by this increase of white blood cells, uh, if a lumbar puncture can be still done, it's good that it's been done so that we can identify what pathogen um, is causing the uh, meningitis. But this occurs, that, that happens in the very few percentage of cases um, among all the lumbar punctures that are, are being conducted. You know, in diagnosis, uh, I think it's a more well-known um, sector industry. We have PCRs trying to lowering um, diagnostic times down to few hours, not covering all pathogens. That's fine, but still doing a great work. Uh, they still need the sample to perform, but they're looking at what is the pathogen that is causing meningitis. Today, um, although it's not vastly used, uh, these machines, um, 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 they, are, um, they are not covering all pathogens. Uh, they are only being used in about 10, 12% of uh, all cases, and they still need the sample. Um, and, and, and out of all samples that are, are uh, analyzed with these devices, most of them are negative, right? Because they come from non meningitis patients. Okay, culture takes uh, too long. And uh, then there's nothing for monitoring, for monitoring the disease. Uh, is the patient reacting to treatment? Uh, is it not? Uh, what happens? Or what happens to those patients who didn't receive a lumbar puncture? Uh, so how can we monitor those patients? So today, uh, unless you do a repeated lumbar puncture or do another, uh, uh, exactly, um, a discharge lumbar puncture, a lumbar puncture in between treatment, you cannot get the white blood cell count information, which gives you information of how, how the disease is evolving or how the patient is responding to treatment. So with that, this device, you will be able to obtain that information as well. The market is the infant meningitis market. We're talking about is 1 billion glo uh, globally. Uh, there are different trends that indicate that this market is growing, uh, different sectors that are pushing into that direction. And the global, the potential global opportunity is, is a, a mixture of uh, the different applications that are very similar to the infant meningitis case, which are, uh, some of them are listed here, like peritonitis is another infection. We are uh, working on a feasibility study and uh, we are analyzing the abdominal fluid called the peritoneal fluid, is the fluid right below the uh, abdominal tissue. And uh, uh, cirrhotic patients um, uh, are suspected often of um, spontaneous bacterial infection, which is the equivalent of meningitis in this, uh, in this fluid. Same thing for the knee, for the fluid in the knee, uh, for the fluid in the, uh, around the lungs, et cetera. We are also try, uh, doing a laboratory tests right now with peak eyes uh, for infection and inflammation of the eye. Um, uh, UV, also known as uveitis. And the other growth, growth potential is based on data. So we are, build, we are building a database from retrospective studies so that we can feed our device with our unique non-invasive cell counting uh, so that we can further support diagnostic and treatment decisions. So once we have identified that patient has meningitis, it is also very clinically relevant to tell that physician whether um, that, uh, that meningitis is viral or is bacterial. And if it's viral, uh, what is, is it a, a, an aggressive virus or is it not? Do, do they require treatment or do they don't? Or they don't? Um, today, the, the antimicrobial resistance uh, problem is a huge problem and we're also working on that direction. Um, I placed this slide about the, the deals here, how attractive the sector is. I placed a bunch of uh, companies either looking into strategically infections or, or the technology. And uh, 
it's really compelling. So if, even though the m and trend is, is, is going a bit low for med tech in general, there's still uh, very attractive deals uh, and, and interest in infections. And, and that's, we are positioning in that range uh, of uh, valuation. Once we have shown market adoption, revenues generation and all that, which are the minimum level of requirements for uh, this type of operations. Once market adoption revenues have been shown. Uh, our business model is based on the, um, on, the, uh, on selling the device and the, and the consumables. So this membrane, this couplet membrane, uh, we, have, I think, uh, we have sorted out the, the price by asking uh, through an outsourced market study um, to 20 key opinion leaders in Europe and the United States, 28, sorry about that. Uh, the idea is that we are the manufacturers, but we will work with strategic partners for commercialization because they have already the commercialization capabilities. It's not something that we need to, to build for ourselves. They know how to get clients uh, efficiently. We want to attack first infant meningitis market. And then because the regulatory strategy, the IP strategy and the technology are the same, are, are covering all these other applications, we can rapidly start attacking the second line applications. This price uh, has the, the advantage, this 10,000 euros for the device has the advantage that uh, you don't require as a pediatrician or a medical director to get approval from central procurement, which slows, slows uh, down um, acquisition times and penetration for us. We are building a very, I guess, a robust project, but also uh, it, that's what, that's a result of the robust team that we are building. Um, uh, above, we have the manage management team, Pablo and, and myself are the co-founders, Rita is the quality, uh, regulatory director, but also helping on management part of the team. And um, we have clinicians uh, from Spain, but also uh, in the Netherlands, uh, becoming our key opinion leaders. They, we have also uh, much interest in the United States. Uh, I spent three years there uh, in Boston and I know um, pediatricians I started working with uh, on the project uh, back there, but also in Los Angeles. And we are building recently a very attractive, uh, and I'm very excited about this, compelling uh, advisors uh, from industry and venture capital firms. And uh, we are, so deals, our agreements are not closed yet, but everyone has kind of the intention and or, or are already doing as advisors until the legal part that is being done. And we have recently accepted an investment offer from uh, uh, um, com two companies who have commercialization capabilities to uh, commercialize the device uh, for Neosonics in, in Spain. And definitely if they can be of any help, they, they, they will be, uh, they have the, the intent to help us once once the time. So that's that's the project, that's the overview. I wanna stop there. And uh, I just built this, added this slide at the end, just to mention the Newborn Solutions Project stands upon three pillars. Uh, many, maybe more, but I think that the ones that I would like to highlight here are the results or achievements. If we don't have this, it doesn't matter how you do things. But at the same time, it matters how you do things, right? I think that's very interesting to talk about the process of how we will manage the different things, uh, like, like um, the investors, uh, IP, regulatory, whatever, but also the emotional part of it. I think that uh, one stands upon each other. So the emotion would be like on the base, implementation on top of it, and then results. But emotion is uh, definitely a part that, a uh, pillar that sustains the project. Uh, because the, there are very tough moments. Uh, there are, there's a lot of people involved and you really need to uh, manage expectations, manage your uh, uh, expectations as well, your emotions. And uh, I think it's a very good thing. If people, uh, just in order to stimulate questions about all these uh, pillars. So Timo, please, um, I'm done. Thank you so much, uh, Javi, for, for this insight. Uh, I think it's really fascinating like, uh, to see uh, how you have managed to find like, a completely new way, you know, that it was like when previously it was very invasive and not 
not that effective uh, to um, uh, to kind of like find uh, or detect meningitis that how you know using the tech it can be so much more efficient less invasive and and how you have actually managed to put together the team as well um, I'm sure uh, we, we got um, many questions popping up uh, in the head of, of our audience and I know that uh, Taik has already one question ready and, and would like to ask you. I think you can stop sharing the screen so we can now have now like have Please don't, video. please don't. Please okay. don't, my question is awesome. Thank you, Javier. Oh, he did, damn it. Never mind. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for this. It's, just, it's pretty cool seeing, I mean, you're definitely a professional. Like you couldn't, you couldn't help yourself to do quite a pitch, pitch commercial business presentation, which is, it's good to see how, how well developed it is. So I have a question regarding precisely this point. So on the, this is noisy here. So right, uh, in the, I think it was like the third slide, uh, in, in the bottom, you say that you decrease the costs of the organization by 47%. Mm -hmm. And you also have like a, an asterisk saying that those are like uh, internally estimated. But like Last my, my coma, cost efficiency study by Jeff Medical Center. See what? So this, this, this number here is related to this um, uh, mark saying that it's... I, I can't see your screen though, you know, right? No, you can't? No. no ah, because Timo, okay, because Timo has stopped it or? Timo, did you stop uh, my sharing the you screen? You can put back the screen, that's that's fine. I, I didn't know that we are going back to the slides. So you, you can like point that specific slide, that's fine. Cool. Yeah, I mean, my, my company does diagnostics yeah. uh, in, in yeah. dermatology. And this is a big one, like being able to support evidence on the cost reducement. That that's a key key point of the ballot paper session, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, th that's the one. Oh yeah, yeah. I couldn't see. I couldn't see the the last yeah. part because of the the thumbnail of your. So, so how how did you? Could you give some some insights on more specifics on how do you measure that? Absolutely. So. Um, uh, the first, so, the, and this is an incomplete reference, meaning that we are also using data, published data from um, uh, Biomedie, uh, which is a big company uh, uh, working on diagnostics on infections. They have actually analyzed, studied the cost reduction, the potential cost reduction of, um, of treating of, of all patients receiving a, a lumbar puncture the same population as ours, uh, and all of them undergoing a PCR uh, for diagnosis, right? And they evaluate different strategies and they say, it's better if you do a PCR to all of them, all those samples. The thing is that they are including, it's not exactly the same population, it's the population who is with a high suspicion of meningitis. Like we're talking about meningitis patients basically. So, why they're doing that analysis? Because they, they want to tell most of meningitis are viral and most of viral meningitis come from enterovirus uh, virus. <laughs> and those don't need treatment, right? This is the same uh, 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 objective that we are aiming with our database uh, value proposition. And uh, if we could treat those enterovirus patients as outpatients, the cost would go down a lot, right? So they're talking about uh, uh, an average of $3,500 per patient, right? Uh, if you multiply by the number of cases, so on and so forth, it gives an estimate which, is, which makes our estimation uh, realistic. So it seems plausible that the reductions that we are uh, proposing in general are um, of that level. Now, because there are no specific cost utility studies for our case, we had to identify the different use cases and, and most popular, uh, most common cases, uh, uh, clinical cases that a patient comes through the emergency department uh, and receives a lumbar puncture 
and is discharged in a few uh, hours. Uh, it, sorry, receives a neosonics uh, measurement, has no meningitis, is discharged. Uh, another patient rece receives, comes to the emergency department, receives a lumbar puncture, uh, waits for uh, cultural results three days. During that time, receives uh, preventive antibiotic treatment, stays at the a short stay, how much that costs. And then we have a 95% a of cases are no meningitis, 5% they are. Or we use neosonics. We use neosonics and we are saving the, so those cases change based on the, uh, on, on, on the use of our device. Another, and the case that most necessary cost generates is the case of you perform a lump puncture. It becomes blood contaminated. You have to wait for, lab, for results, uh, three days, and you keep that patient hospitalized because the number, the, the average number of um, lumbar punctures that are blood contaminated, it's about 20%. And something that could cost like 50 euros plus pre lumbar puncture costs uh, is pre lumbar puncture costs plus uh, 5,000 euros or 3,000 euros. So we are saving a lot of money there. And base, and we have also located these use cases based on the hospital capabilities. So large volume hospitals, they have all those capabilities, but small hospitals, they don't have uh, intensive care units. So no need to present cases there. Don't need to do that analysis there. So at the end, we have used that, that data, but also we have pulled data from the uh, HCUP database from the United States, it's a great uh, source of data because you can pull, it, it represents economic data and discharge data from out of 20% out of, of all hospitals in the United States. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm just Googling it and it's quite tasty. Yeah. Uh, oh. So that's a way you can cross validate all these figures and you come down to a, a range and, and, and that's how we have estimated uh, our costs but also the number of lumbar punctures, you can get direct, you can get the number of lumbar punctures uh, or at the emergency department and as an inpatient from that database for the United States on 20% of the hospitals for infants younger than 12 uh, months of age. So at the end, you need to extrapolate a bit, but you get closer, right? To a, to a true estimate, to a true a realistic figure. That's awesome. Thank you so much. It's, uh, once again, yes, it's great to talk to someone who's definitely on a, on a more advanced level. Yeah, I think it's very amazing how, how Javi, you have managed to, you know, it looks like you are like there is a full database in your head and you know, full procedures uh, that, that, that I think you can not only write one book, but like a, a series of books how to uh, to get access to interesting uh, data sets and, and make use of those because actually um, in the EIT health world, I don't know one thing you have heard or not, uh, there is a pilot product uh, at a project that was started last year, uh, biobanks and bioregisters where in Scandinavia, they have opened up the databases. So like different startups from Europe can apply and access that data that if you don't only want to use the US data uh, and want to, for example, use the data uh, in the Nordics, different biobanks and bioregisters uh, to validate your ideas, uh, then, then th th there are options out there. We, we have a grant. So that program is called the Sandbox. Yes, and Digital Sandbox. Yeah. We accomplished that grant and we, this, uh, you still see my, my screen. So this one, it's, it, it went down to 900 registries eventually, uh, but, but uh, we have uh, used that uh, grant, that project to, to pursue this uh, value proposition, this database value proposition. And very, I, very I much think, value. And I think that's, uh, that's also very interesting. And, and like, it's always like better when, you know, when you want to later do the sales, I think what was very fascinating about you also said that you know exactly like how much you can charge to avoid procurement because like usually when you have to do those pre-procurement series, you know, 
legal side takes so long time that you know it, it slows down the sales cycle that that again like linking the data knowing exactly what's the value you uh, provide them that knows how much you can charge uh, based on value that um, that uh, I think that's that's very amazing does anyone else has a question uh, I mean Javi is a great expert so don't be shy he's not biting you and not going to do you a painful lumbar puncture, but he's, he's here to share his know-how uh, through this technical channel, uh, which is non-invasive. Uh, Zoom is non-invasive as well. So feel free to ask question, raise your hand, uh, or uh, uh, Quick one. straight up uh, question. Are you in Madrid? I'm located in Barcelona. Barcelona, OK. OK, I'm in Valencia. Bar ah, good. Okay. I see yeah. Marina has a question. Floor is yours. Yes. Hello. Uh, nice to be here tonight. And uh, actually, lumbar puncture is not painful, so I'm not afraid that uh, something will go uh, wrong. And I would love to ask you, Javier, uh, what would you advise to um, a young founder, fresh founder, uh, in case of building a funnel, uh, sales funnel? Yeah. Basically, this is my question. Thank you. Hi, Marina. I, I, I don't think I understood like, uh, the two things. One is you said the lumbar puncture is not painful. Is that correct? You said that? Yeah, I'm sorry because I had it, so I didn't feel pain. So that's why I'm saying this. Maybe I'm wrong. Sorry. Uh, well, just, just to comment on that, um, you can. There are so many opinions about this. I'm, I'm very excited that you, you raised this point. So when you ask um, uh, physicians or pediatricians, they, some of them tell you, uh, it's like, you don't really want to do it. Uh, and I've, I've been present in, in lumbar punctures. So I want to see it myself, right? So, but you can find pediatricians telling you, they have not generated the, the, the brain and all that. So they don't, they're not feeling it. Um, I've been pressing in a lumbar puncture, in a few lumbar punctures, and I remember one very clearly. Five attempts, three different users, no fluid drawn. The baby crying like crazy, parents scared to death, right? And that happens a lot. And, it's, and you can see reported data, published data, like up to 50% of lumbar punctures in neonates, um, got, get blood and are so the, the, this it's and you can just Google uh, in YouTube lumbar puncture uh, uh, infant and you will see a baby like pressing the chest. You know why they press the chest because it's painful. You know why uh, uh, there's a, a contraindication for babies to receive a lumbar puncture that is respiratory stress. So if they have respiratory problems, they cannot receive a lumbar puncture because they can get into respiratory shock because it's painful. Gen e, I, but I agree with you in certain occasions, it can be very like, you slide, very nice job to put it over and nothing happened, but it can, be become, it can become very painful. And, uh, and then the second question was related to commercialization. You were talking about the, about the funnel, but I didn't get the the what you really uh, meant, Marina. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was not precise. Uh, my question was, uh, what are your advices uh, in terms of uh, to fresh founder? I mean, I'm a fresh founder. I just uh, I made a company, and uh, we are trying to make uh, the super unique and new product, which is actually doesn't exist. Um, another, let's say competitors, and uh, we are trying to make a sales funnel. And for me, it's uh, like huge uh, magic because I'm just trying to point with a finger to Sky. So maybe you have some uh, general advices in this case, like what to do and what not, maybe not to do in this case. Uh, and yeah, my startup is connected uh, direct, directly with the uh, pediatrics. So yeah, is my question clear or not so? I, I, I think it's uh, general. And uh, 
I will pick one of my key advices uh, when you're building up sort of your, your, your business plan, which means how you want to do things on, on different fronts. And is that you validate everything. So in the same way that you validate um, the need by asking pediatricians uh, and parents and, and nurses and, and literature, and then you go and validate the, what's the best technology and go to technicians and technologists and uh, papers again, you do the same for the business. So uh, I read the conversation we had before on the cost uh, reduction. So I could just take in a, a figure there and point at that and say, so we are saving about that money. But I cross-validated uh, the percentage of reduction based on different sources. And the true value of validating things, each, each thing, uh, is, is gives you a lot of credibility before all your, um, um, the, the people you're talking to. Um, and very good people to talk to are those who have already gone through that experience before. So one thing, for instance, who do you recruit first in your team? I don't know, I'm the first entrepreneur. So I went to ask those who had the same problem. So other startups in the same area or field. And I went to ask them, who did you recruit first? And why, What's, what were the reasons to do so? And then you draw your own conclusions and make your own decision. So you don't need, you don't need to copy. But uh, in our case, it worked out very, very effectively, um, fortunately. So that's, that's my recommendation. Thank, thank you so much for, I mean, um, you're always very detailed. And I think that's, that's something that it's always great to back up the data and, and, and um, that all the decisions actually make sense. Uh, Jean, you had also a question for uh, uh, Javier. Yeah, thanks, Timo. And hi, Javier. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, well, it, it, it's been a pleasure to, uh, I was very happy to see you winning uh, Catapult. We met a couple of years ago and you met, uh, you accomplished so much in only two years. So congratulations for that. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, uh, well, first, uh, I was very, very impressed on, on the, on, I don't know if it was the first or second slide, because even if uh, meningitis has a low incidence, uh, you know, because I, I was just checking the number of uh, childbirths every year in Europe, and it's more than 4.2 million. So even if it's low incidence, that uh, 250K, you know, that the uh, tests that are doing, if uh, you are avoiding like a ton of, uh, of unnecessary tests uh, or you will ab avoid. So that's, for me, it's, it's, it's incredible. So the impact for, of the project, is great. So, <laughs> so keep going on that. Thank you. Well, I wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions. First, I, I didn't understand very well the business model that you uh, mentioned that is a margin. I guess that it's from manufacturing. Or are they, uh, Here. because you mentioned margin and commission. Can you just uh, explain this a little bit? Uh, 10 yeah. seconds, or oh, no, sorry, go, go, <laughs> let's go. No, absolutely, I, I think I got your question. So, yeah. so the, the, the price to the buyer, the hospital or the uh, insurance, public or private, is 10,000 euros for the device, 50 for the consumable. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's a 25% margin. So, so, so 25% of, of, of the device price is the money that the distributor or comm commercialization company makes out of it. And 40% for the disposable because it's a disposable precisely. And they are more eager to make money out of disposables. Right? So these are margins, again, and going back to Marina's question, these are margins that we validated at Medica interviewing 20 companies that did only commercialization of medical devices, of similar medical devices. Um, and, and it has never changed uh, from there. And then our margins as a manufacturer are 
for the uh, device. So meaning that the manufacturing cost is 20, uh, 2000 euros. And that the uh, margin for the uh, 50 euros consumable is 96%. So it's costing us very, very little. Okay, understood, thank you. And regarding the market, uh, the 370 million, it's from the total addressable market or it just, uh, so uh, the, what was that bar? That was the bar in Europe or? The 370 million? Mm -hmm. Yes. From Europe only. Okay. And, uh, and then that is when it comes like the, the rule of thumb that gives you to the 1 billion. So it is, it is accepted that the same similar market size is uh, Europe and the United States that gives you two thirds. And it's also accepted that the rest of the world is another third. So okay. it's, the, it's the more most precise figure that we can present and justify with some evidence. Okay, great, understood. So um, b before ending, um, more than a question, it's uh, if, if you could develop a little bit uh, the services, the commercial services that you are thinking to develop, I don't know if now or in the future uh, with the data, you know, that, that part uh, on the bottom, on the right on your, <laughs> on your slide. And also if you can explain a little bit your investment roadmap, you know, what, what you had to, or where did you get the, your f financing in the past? And maybe what are your next steps for that? Thanks, sure. Javier. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Pleasure to talk to you. So the, the database, uh, database value proposition, um, so the way we are envisioning uh, the, its implementation, uh, it's, it's not really defined. So we need to do usability studies, uh, focus groups and all that. And then, um, but, but, the, but we have like preliminary results that are telling us if you have, um, if you be beyond our non-invasive measurement of white blood cell count, you have two other parameters, we can tell you whether that patient has sepsis, meningitis, or none of the before. So we can classify those patients. And if you give me 15 parameters, one of those white blood cell count, non-invasively obtained, uh, we can tell you uh, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, which has uh, better precision and accuracy uh, values than those published as of now. Um, so it's, it's very good preliminary results. So the way we see, and, and, and I'm mentioning these three versus 15 parameters because it's relevant. If you had only three parameters to enter into the machine on our base, which has a display to show you the white blood cell count, we could just develop an interface so you put there the other two parameters. And we, I give you that extra information. But because some other functions or, or per, um, prediction capabilities require more parameters, 17 parameters, 15 parameters is now annoying to input uh, on, the, on the base. So you should go to a web app or a, a that there could be a program or software installed into the uh, computer uh, at the hospital. I'm not meaning that we need to connect outside the hospital, which leads to uh, huge hurdles from a regulatory perspective uh, today. Uh, a regulatory frame is not really uh, um, uh, uh, finely defined uh, today. So that we are seeing this as we're based selling the, the device with a non-invasive cell counting capability. You want this extra functionality, you pay for the license and you have it, but we don't, we don't know yet um, how to monetize that. We don't know how, what's the price for instance. So we should do those uh, market uh, oriented studies uh, to, to, to develop the business model be, behind that. But that's how we env are envisioning this uh, database value proposition. Oh, well, thank you so much, uh, Tavi. And and I, I think uh, the data is the key. I've, I've seen like some other health techs as well, like in the field of sleep or um, 
uh, in in like a heart rhythm how bioforum is of singapore for example it's it's like it's just a small data and they can predict things two weeks in advance however we have few more questions coming in and imbra floor is yours i see that you have uh, quite a few questions for javier uh, hello everyone hello javier uh, thank you for your time and this wonderful lecture and your insights um thank you. I, I would like to I would like to ask three questions. The first is, how did you put together your team? Uh, what did you pay attention or focus on as you put together your team? Um, so the first the first person I recruited was uh, Rita. Uh, and sorry because I don't I didn't answer the the <laughs> the investment uh, steps that we went through. I mean, let's move around from Joanne. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe we can, uh, or somebody else has this question. <laughs> so Imre, um, the first uh, uh, person I hired was Rita, and she's the director of regulatory. And uh, I, I, do, I draw that conclusion to recruit her because everything that we had to develop had to be within a regulatory framework, a given regulatory framework. So. It was like nonsense to me to start doing things and then we adapt. So we had to make out the most out of our money, right? Uh, Pablo is our uh, financial director and he's the co-founder and he's not a full-time employee. So we have now uh, two positions covered. I'm, um, I'm uh, an MBA, I'm biomedical engineer, uh, telecommunications engineer and PhD of biomedical engineering. And uh, that means that at the beginning, I could sort out kind of the technical stuff myself uh, while I was developing the business plan. But I was much, much, much supported by a collaboration with uh, the National Research Institute in Spain, which is called CESIC, right? Uh, and, you know, they had labs, they have labs, they have the ultrasound uh, expertise. Uh, so we could work together with us, not even having a lab space. Uh, then with the grants and investment, I could hire the, the technical guy, the technical director. So we could do our own designs on the mechanical parts and the probe, the base and all that. Uh, so I was at the company then, the, and I am still the guy with most knowledge on ultrasound. Uh, and that will change with time. Like, <laughs> and uh, then we hired the data scientist because before to collect data we need the device. That's why we hired the, the technical director. And now that we have data, we need to embed that those uh, models, uh, ne neural networks uh, models into the hardware because we are not uploading them onto the onto the cloud. So we, no, we need somebody that helps us integrate that into efficient microprocessors that at the same time are also oriented to using artificial intelligence. But that profile is not that often found. So we have now a software engineer that is helping us out with that. Rita, the, the regulatory director, is also a biologist by training. So she's the one developing the membranes. And that's a very, so at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, if you have people, versatile people who can develop like uh, different areas of the different areas of the company, so much the better, so much the better, because they they, they are full of activity, they they feel productive, they generate more, and, and you are um, you can pay more, and there's uh, uh, and uh, you advance more rapidly, so uh, with fewer people but better paid. So um, I'm very happy with this configuration that we have now. Next member, uh, uh, communication director, uh, which is already uh, like uh, uh, committed, but we are waiting for the right time and, and uh, we applied for a grant. If it's positive, she, uh, she will uh, incorporate in immediately. I think that's very fascinating how you have been like really hiring based on the demand in order to really have like very complementary team and with a focus to move as fast as you can. I think that's also was the, the compliment from Joan that who said like, wow, what you have done in, in just two years. So um, 
maybe it's coming from the US because over there, I think it's always, they think like startup is all about, you know, how we can grow in speed. Um, that's pretty amazing. Uh, there was the question on investment and then uh, Imre still has a few questions as well. So do I answer the question on investment or do I take on? Or, or maybe let's, let's take more from Imre and then uh, we can still like, maybe there is something. Imre, I think you had something regarding uh, money as well. So maybe you can combine that. Yes, that's the third question that uh, for how many years ahead did you approximate the money you need? So like runway, uh, how, how, yeah. how long runway are you usually planning before fundraise? Okay, uh, one year. So, so you mean how, how long will I be able to run with the money I raise? Yes. Yeah, so one year. Uh, that's that's um, the way I, I usually do it. And uh, that means that I work six months solely on the project, six months or more on raising the funding and combining with development, but it takes that match. I'm being shorter here so that I can answer more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe one of the questions, uh, I think what Sean had regarding, uh, Sean, you can like correct me, but was also like, how did you find that kind of, in, how, how did you build up your investment pipeline? Because like, I, I think, uh, I know that you were working uh, at MIT. So in the US, usually maybe the approach is a bit different where they like, if they have faith in you, uh, it's maybe easier to fundraise versus I think in Europe where they are more suspicious that, Show me that you're also already making millions in revenue, and then maybe we want to like get the yeah. slice of that. That they, they, I have at least a sense that usually the European sources are more conservative. But you also mentioned grants, so it's it's like you managed to build up quite a sophisticated uh, financial like a pipeline to support the activities, right? I think there's one word that I think that, that we're, we're doing very well. It's conveying trust, mm -hmm. conveying confidence. That summarizes everything. Uh, because if somebody's putting money on you privately or publicly, they need to have the highest chan uh, chances of success for that money. So what validation, how you build a business model, how you show the evidence, one thing. A reputation in the sense, the awards that we received the innovator under 35 uh, by MIT. So mm -hmm. the Spanish innovator, um, very good price to have. So a month later, we received emails from private investors. Uh, so that would help us uh, start. Um, four months later, we also obtained the first grant, a Spanish grant. And uh, the success for the grant was that I had failed many times on writing grants before, but I had excelled on an understanding how to write grants on and targeting every message. So we have a high rate, high success rate every time we, we ask for grants. It's not that we ask many for many grants, but the ones we are asking for, uh, we have very uh, high success rate. Um, so I would say that conveying that story, build how you build that story, how you write down that story, because if you don't communicate well, it doesn't matter what you have built. And then um, uh, recognition and the, of course, the project needs to be attractive and mm -hmm. you, need to, you need to have key ingredients. In our case, and to give you a, an idea, we couldn't accept private investment until we got our first our licensing agreement for the first patent that we generated once I was at MIT at the beginning. So um, once we obtained the licensing agreement, then we could accept the private investment. But we have ev we had everything aligned uh, so, so that uh, things would fall uh, onto each other. And I, I think one of, one of interesting position probably when as a CEO, it's it's like for building that trust and like that even you have that validated data. I, I think one thing is what you kind of, I think mentioned is, is that you have to speak the language, you know, that 
like it's one language probably you have to talk with other medical professionals investors even though they might speak spanish or english it's a bit different like in a way that to really like get the story there and and probably also the ones that are reading grant applications at least based on my experience they're also using a bit different language so uh, you really have to be like <laughs> of of like translator between all the groups that uh, that you can like communicate in in let's say 10 different versions of spanish depending uh, to whom you're talking to yeah so and to summarize uh, the our investment like track record every year since 2017 we have made an investment round uh, of a private investor like non-institutional uh, business mm -hmm. angel at the beginning uh, even some family and friends participated but then the investors became more and more professional. Um, and, uh, and that's given us much value. And lately, these investors are, have commercialization companies that uh, do want to uh, have the intent to help us uh, when the right time comes. So um, we have built much value out of our investors, our investors beyond the money that they have brought. But as I said, and, 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 and Timo was referring to, um, they have expectations. Some of them, they, they call you, hey, Harry, how are you doing? Some others, you don't know about them. Uh, you send the newsletters uh, and, and with how you have been advancing every three months, uh, if possible. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, I have a personal relationship with each of them because it's, it's a very important amount of money that they have put into the company. Uh, um, so, um, some of them, they want to talk once a year. Some of them want to talk 10 times a year. So it's also a, a man, management, expectations management. I think it's, it's actually what, I mean, I have been a lot of following uh, what's happening in the US. And I think in the US, there is a saying that, you know, uh, in the early stage, actually those investors, you should select more carefully than your spouse because like, an average marriage in the US is seven years, but let's say if you are early stage startup and you are uh, getting involved in a fund that is also early stage, usually they have like 10 year funds. So you would be in a relationship for 10 years. So it's, it would be longer than a marriage, statistically speaking. So uh, choose your spouse well and, and, and usually you don't get married after the first date, but, but you have the more of those communication events. Uh, it has been a great, we have had a long discussion. Still, uh, I see that some qu uh, people haven't asked a question. Olga, I think, has been quite Petro, like, uh, this is your last chance to get hold of Javier. I mean, he's very busy, as you can see, uh, <laughs> of going faster and faster every year um, as a rocket ship. So currently is uh, your unique opportunity uh, to, uh, to still ask a question from him. You do have more opportunities if you send me an email with your questions. <laughs> 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 but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's like, it's always like, uh, I think personal, um, well, this is also probably a big, building your let's say if if some of the audience you're still like in early stage i think what at least for me uh the journey has been that that in the beginning often researchers uh, what i have seen they are very shy and it takes quite you know a learning curve to to become like a great speaker and and to kind of talk in all those different languages to the investors to the public to, to different stakeholders, uh, home and abroad, that, that... Javier, yeah. uh, if, if, uh, if you can uh, tell us about the IP protection uh, a little bit, because uh, you work with uh, in the US and uh, in Europe, and uh, did you file an IP patent in the US as well as, well as in Europe? Oh, so um, as I was an, uh, an MIT inventor when I generated this idea, um, so mm, we filed a provisional patent uh, in the US first. It's a method covering all applications. It's a non-invasive detection of circulating cells in superficial body fluids by means of high resolution ultrasound. So 
we're talking about all sorts of infections in, in this place. Um, then it became a PCT patent filing, which means that you can initiate a simultaneous patent protection on different geographical regions around the globe. And we covered uh, Europe, uh, United States, Canada, China, Japan, and India. That's costly, that costs money. Um, and now, so you don't have one patent, you have one patent in each territory. Uh, early last year, we had approval from the US on that patent. No objections, everything approved. So great, great accomplishment. And um, we, um, we are now under examination in, in Europe. Uh, some, some agencies go faster, some others, but it's, uh, I think it's like two years process uh, already. Um, and yeah, well, we are confident, but because we have that approval from the US, we, are, we feel confident about the, our um, um, responses to the uh, objections from different offices and, and, and it looks good. Now we have freedom to operate and positive patentability for the probe, for the device. And we are filing uh, uh, soon, uh, like coming months probably. And all your co-workers are from Spain? No, the software engineer is from Iran. And, and um, uh, they have to find, they, they have to sign a confidentiality uh, contract, right? Clause. So in the contract, they have a clause. Confidentiality clause. Uh, confidentiality clause. And uh, by which um, law is it governed? This, I, uh, you get me there. That's, that's, I go, I'm going down into detail, but that's a very detailed question. I would say it's the Spanish law. Spanish law, yeah. Okay, thank you. I guess. There's also another clause related to non-competence. So if they leave, they, they can no work on something that is competing with us. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, I think it's, it's very good. I mean, maybe even actually uh, it could be one of the topic. I, I think that there could be lots of legal nuances. So it, maybe it could be like another webinar uh, at EIT Health Alumni uh, on the legal nuances that the founders have to, to know um, when, when like starting new ventures, because it's how to hire, also founders agreement if there is more of you uh, to get the first paperwork straight. And, and I think what also Javier said that in the devices framework, it's good to have on early stage, a person on board who knows really like the regulatory affairs to, to make sure that all the paperwork is done properly from, from uh, day one. Much, much of the uh, money that we spent during the first year, 2017, it was on contracts and, and lawyers and, uh, and a business consultant, uh, Marta Pinsat. So uh, why? Because we wanted to have IP covered. So we, we had collaborations with uh, two hospitals in Madrid, uh, an, an institution here in Barcelona, uh, the National Research Institute, four cent, so it's what, four, four companies already, four uh, collaborations. So it's, it's worth protecting your IP. And uh, like maybe a few sideline comments, like it's actually you also want to protect it when you are like doing those projects outside, but even like within your team, because I mean, this we could go deeper, but, but sometimes when there is like more than one founder, you really want to make sure that if, if somebody has been working, you want that all the IP would belong to the company, not into as, as an individual, but um, yeah, we could go go deep into that. Does anyone still have uh, the last question uh, from uh, Javier? If not, um, there is also a message from Robin that if you see on the chat, uh, there is a, a link uh, you can click and and after wrapping up, uh, you there is a survey which you can. Uh, um, Am I still sharing? You're still sharing, I think. Let me let me pause. Ah, that. yes, there you go. Okay, okay. cool. Ah, chat. Uh, <laughs> oh, 
But okay. who was the question? I think Olga is uh, too shy to ask this time, so probably she will send an email. I see at least in the chat, she's like just saying thank you. But but um, well, I it's, I think it's like also in the business world, like you have to act up. Like if you want to be on the spotlight, you know, uh, nobody brings you things on the silver platter. I think what Xavier also said that, you know, if I mean, nobody wants to just give you money right away, but you have to file certain applica I mean, uh, applications for grants and things, uh, applications to participate in competitions, win the competition, and then people come to you uh, to say like, hey, you know, you're a superstar. Uh, let, me, let me give you like a million or two or five. Uh, <laughs> if only. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, if there are more questions, I just wanted to uh, end up with a reflection. Yeah. If you recall, I ended my slide presentation with a slide talking about three pillars, mm. accomplishments, the process, how you do it, and the emotion. Nobody has ever has done a question about the emotional part. And, and, and it's just to tell you, it is as important, if not more, than the other pillars, because you know, to go through not having a licensing agreement, for instance, since Imbri asked, and having to go to Boston, paying your own flight ticket to get people do things, uh, and then back to Madrid, and I need that licensing agreement, otherwise this project is ended. I'm done. I cannot follow. You really need to build, grow a thick skin on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and mature emotionally and evolve emotionally. And when you need to recruit people, I, so when I recruited Rita at first, I, I, I don't know, Rita, what are you asking about? I don't know. But now I'm recruiting Hossein and, and I have plenty of expertise about that. Or, or I, I'm more fine on, on what I'm looking at. Um, so, so the emotional part is a big deal. Uh, don't, don't put it aside. <laughs> That's my I think it, recommendation. I, I think often like, you know, it's the success is like an iceberg that, you know, it's like you always see those shiny awards, but but the hard work is often hidden. There's the sweat, the tears, the blood uh, that, that, is, that is flowing there and, and definitely a hard one. You always present the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean... I, you don't want to bore with the, with the hard, hard thing of it. <laughs> yeah, although, I mean, I think it was also one MIT researcher who came up with a CV of failures that like, I think it was from MIT that he was a professor and he made a CV of failures that, hey, actually these are all the things that I have failed at, that yes, I have like got like these awards, but you know, this is a long list of things that, you know, uh, didn't work out, um, and uh, and at the same time, you know, it's it's interesting as well. Or those moments where you really like. Actually, a year ago, I was in Tokyo, and and my only way to get food was luckily I was doing couch surfing. So <laughs> my host was uh, luckily providing me um, with some food because otherwise uh, uh, I probably would have starved a bit. <laughs> but but you know you have you have like days like that that you have to be like a camel that is building that fat that you know <laughs> in the past when you had startup events you could like eat up in the buffet and then then use that energy for the rest of the week. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we I think we are every time more in a very compelling context. Like there's yeah. there's funding out there, mm -hmm. and 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 I don't think that we are. If you really need much, much money, okay, the US. But don't get wrong with the US when you're starting to, to be that project that highlights among the thousand of projects that need to be analyzed uh, from, from the different VCs or whatever. It's very hard. It's very hard. Um, when, you, when I went back to Spain with that, this, this project, my project was highlighting very much whenever I presented it and it gave me visibility. So mm -hmm. it put me in a better context and a more comfortable. So it lowered, the, there were not many, uh, plenty, uh, 
much few, uh, fewer projects. And, and the project was very attractive. So he gave me a good start. And um, yeah, that thing about failing. And so in the United States, they, they allow you making mistakes. They, nobody likes you failing. <laughs> so that's, that's where I learned too. And, uh, but it's definitely, if you need like tens of thousands of, of millions, uh, maybe it's a good scenario over there. Um, regulatory wise, uh, or, or, or from a commercialization perspective, much better. But uh, the European context, um, we, we can only be thankful uh, to the community government, to the uh, national government and to European government because we have received grants from all of them. And, um, and, and, and it's not the amount of money that we have received, but the value that we have been able to draw from that project funded with 4,000 euros, uh, 40,000 euros with the sandbox, mm -hmm. for instance, or the Head Start from EIT Health or Neotech in Spain. So it's, it's the value that you generate. Uh, so uh, I think the context um, is improving a lot and that uh, it's encouraging. If you really want to uh, become a first entrepreneur, it's a good time to start. And I think it's building that trust that that you know if you get that award like forty thousand or fifty thousand, it's kind of also validating that you know uh, usually it's known that let's say two thousand companies apply that you are really cream of the cream, the top one percent that has passed all the hurdles. So it's not just an idea, but it's you know validated by experts that that's a serious thing. But good. Uh, well. Uh, talking about money uh, and seriousness and time, um, it has been very nice, uh, now actually even more than an hour discussion. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Uh, Javier, thank you so much for sharing all this. Um, I think always, you know, the most interesting events, at least I enjoy, are when you hear these personal stories, uh, not some kind of third party a consultant talking about cases that, you know, uh, who has not, I mean, it has been very far. It's, it's like, you know, reading the books, it's like first-hand account experience. So thank you so much for providing that first account um, experience in, in our EIT Health Alumni community. And I hope that many of you attending today, one day we can uh, also invite you, uh, maybe it took uh, you three years, Javier, so maybe three years from now, two years from now, uh, to be the CEO featured in our roundtable. Uh, if you want to see other events like that, follow the events at alumni.eithealth.eu section uh, and, and see all the new uh, events, uh, discussions and roundtables coming up. But thank you so much everybody for joining in and, and, uh, and looking forward to see you um, at other EIT Health alumni events later this year. And, and hopefully uh, this year also the EIT Health Summit will take place because like the catapult finals usually are in a very final. I mean, like we had the last ones actually was in Paris 2019. This year, the Stockholm one didn't take place, uh, which was sad. Otherwise, Javier, you would have been like on the big stage there uh, taking the award, but, but I hope that you are still joining us uh, in Stockholm. Hopefully this year, Corona pre permitting that. All right, Timo, so thank you very much. Uh, truly, uh, it's always a, a pleasure and an honor to share uh, with uh, others alike and to try to uh, help uh, people uh, as other people has, uh, have helped me in the past. So um, thank you for organizing events like this. Uh, and thank you all the attendees. Thank you and bye. Goodbye. Yeah, bye. Goodbye.